I grew up in Ohio in the 70s. And me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest. And my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen, we built shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion, the polar stand by me. This is based in the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out into the country. But instead of looking for a body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from, and a camp of little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous, and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers, we discovered bridges. No one went to we fished we hid from trains. At night, we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idealic. In fact, it was so fun. We did it multiple times never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We do stuff with family in the day, and a night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night Joe and I got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well nostalgia and beer a heck of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails camp one night and walk home. The day came, we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map. So I gave a shore. And off we went. The day went fine. It was fun and little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill, and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe 100 or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom about 100 yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen no lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly. And as we neared the building we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews in the built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to beyond all that there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately went back up the hill to our spot, we had ficked a camp having a hill between us, and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit besides, 
At this point it was dusk and we had just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we land our hammocks and shot the breeze we'll begin to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of her hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days, it was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church. And the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to can you believe this? The light looked to be like candle light from the way it flickered. And though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while trying to see who was in there. But we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out. But this voice thoroughly scared the life out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you could see in movies. But again, it was like he was speaking in a different language, because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something. And then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while. And then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, all right, let's get out of here. When Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed. They're coming out. They're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well. But we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands and single file. We could see some of them had flashlights and they began to sing again and the light from the flashlights began to move towards us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff and ran to the tracks. Once there we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road bar map. We knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around. But I heard those voices. And they shared and sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. I was working as an assistant manager at a local KFC where I worked for roughly two to three years. I have some very good memories from this place as well as some really funny stories. We became severely understaffed at one point and my general manager at the time left to work for CC's Pizza, another local chain. Because of this I was left in charge of the store until they found or decided on a replacement for him. After probably three months or so. During this time, tensions were high due to our staffing issues, and I was given a raise for holding down the fort. Keeping the store open, despite most of the employees walking out on me the one night they finally sent us help a guy and several of his employees from a store located about 40 minutes away. Some things to understand about the store. It was located in a very wealthy neighborhood and subsequently had very wealthy employees. Anyway, the new manager Mike comes in and immediately starts barking orders at everyone. Obviously no one is listening to him. 
but when I tell them to do the exact same thing, they get it done post haste. He asked me why they won't listen to him, but will listen to me. And I explained to him that they aren't here for the money. They're here for the experience. I remind him that they're driving Ferraris to work and that he needs to be their friend and their boss. In other words, earn the respect and they will respect you. He agrees to let up on them and try it my way. Instead, he did listen to me and did start to earn the respect. Then he turns on me and starts demanding stupid and ridiculous things around the store, most of which are related to late night cleaning, which he knew I didn't do myself and didn't have time for with deposits and whatnot. I got admittedly angry and told him to screw off. After a few weeks of this and a serious amount of stress over the last few months, I decided to put in my two weeks notice. At this point, I already started looking for a job elsewhere and had several offers on the table. I took a job about two miles up the street of the local Burger King as their general manager. I ended up working a lot of late shifts because we were understaffed for those particular shifts. This was fine, but it also meant closing the front by myself, mopping storefront locking doors, etc. While my cook closed the back of the house, I didn't really pay much attention at first, it was barely noticeable. But at the same time every night, the same car would park in the front of the lot facing the store and just sit there for hours on end. I honestly thought it was kids making out or something at first, but that clearly was not the case. I was always last to leave the store and set the alarm. One night, the second I lock the door behind me and start to head to my car. The engine turns over in the car at the front of the restaurant. It startled me so I looked over, but all I could see was the headlights and the car didn't move. I hurried to my vehicle and started to drive away. The second I left the parking lot, so did the other car in the parking lot. My drive wasn't particularly far from home, but I had this gut feeling that it would be a bad idea to head there. I start down the very empty 1am highway and switch into the left lane with the guy still following behind me. After a minute or two at 10 or 15 miles above the speed limit, I decided to switch into the right lane and drastically slow down to see if he'll pass me. The guy also switches over and slows drastically down. Now, I'm not stupid. I know when I'm being followed in at this point, I'm scared. I grab my almost dead phone and call my husband. I frantically spout off what's going on and he tells me to drive to the police station, so I start heading in that direction. I don't know if this guy caught on to that or not. But right before we hit the road the station is on. He blows by me at an insane speed and keeps driving. I turned around and went home. Fast forward another week and I see the same guy sitting out in the parking lot again in the same car. This time I called the cops right away at the urging of my cook and my assistant manager. The cops showed up and get the guy to come out of the car. It's Mike from my old job. He tells them he wasn't doing anything wrong and developed a crush on me from our time together at old job and just wanted to say hi. They didn't arrest him, but told him to get out of there, saying that he was loitering and put enough fear into him that thankfully, he didn't show back up again. To give the context of where the story is based. I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium-sized city. The town itself doesn't have a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to the demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the college are mostly open 24-7 so that the college kids will be able to impulse by whatever they like. The other bigger seller around here is gas. Of course gas can be bought in the city the being a town that is often gone through in order to get to the city. A lot of places will try to keep the price of gas slightly lower than any of the stations in the city. My story begins when I was working overnights in a gas station slash liquor store when I was doing part-time classes in college, but mostly doing classes online so they wouldn't ruin my availability for a full-time job. The store that I worked at only had one person working on overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people especially girls would complain the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people going into a liquor store gas station in the middle of the night. The owner's hand was forced on one night before I started working there. 
When a woman who came in to buy milk went outside to her car only for a man that come up behind her and shove a gun to her back demanding her money, she complied with him. And luckily he let her go. She ran into the store sobbing hysterically. And though police arrived shortly after, he was never found, I personally preferred having two people on, even if there wasn't the safety issue. The night seemed to go by so much quicker when there was someone else there. And it was really nice of the person I normally close with. And I got along so well. Overall, there were four overnight shift workers, Josh, Nick Dixie, and myself. Dixie had another job and really was only working there as a favor to one of the managers. So she would only work two nights a week with either Josh or I, Josh, and I worked together three nights a week. And Nick worked with Josh, right two nights a week. Dixie was really nice and fun to be around. But she didn't particularly like the job or want to be there. Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did all the work. But it was only one night a week, so he didn't complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a bit different. He worked there five days a week just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with one person more than one day a week. Nobody seemed to really like him or like working with him. Nick was a little off in the start. He was one of those people who told you his entire life story as soon as he met you, giving a bunch of really personal details that no one really felt comfortable hearing. One thing he always seemed to talk about was the strain on his marriage. Apparently, he had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time. And the drug park got better when he could switch over to smoking. But he couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. He was really hard to be around. But you kind of get used to some people in that kind of job being sketchy. I was there for almost three months, when Nick's story seemed to escalate out of nowhere, he began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath. And he had to take a bunch of pills for it every day. So he wouldn't become violent. And exactly what you want to hear from someone you're alone with in the middle of the night. But okay, we all have our problems, and some people get dealt a bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I myself have always struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control. And without medicine, I wouldn't be killing by any means. But I'd probably be hospitalized and a danger to myself category. So as creepy as that was, I assured him that a lot of people need to take medicine for some kind of illness. And as long as you stick to it and are honest with medical professionals, there's no reason he can still do anything anyone else can do. He seemed pleased with his answer. And soon after the subject was turned to other things. He was especially cheery and nice to me after that for the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine and felt like things were going well with him. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everyone, especially Josh was aware of how much I wish he would stop talking to me about it, and would leave me alone. Josh had a wife and daughter who was two at the time, so he couldn't help but see us younger girls through the eyes of what his daughter might potentially have to deal with when she was our age, and seemed to go out of his way to end my conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I was grateful for and didn't really try to pretend that he liked Nick. It wasn't long before Nick started conversations with me going into details about why he was diagnosed and said of how his medicine was working, which I won't get into here because a lot of it is very violent and intimate. I told him repeatedly that I didn't want to know about that to which he would act like he understood and changed the subject, only for him to circle back to it an hour later, when I couldn't find it to Dixie about it. She told me that she would take care of it and told her friend, which was the manager who asked her to come to work there. The manager couldn't really do much since I seemed to be the only one that he would talk to about these things, and told me to come to her again, if he ever made me feel uncomfortable again. He was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone working with him after he was talked to by the manager and soon enough to other women who worked with him on the night shift reported comments that he had made to them to the manager. I was questioned in which I agreed that all of the statements made by the women were similar to things that had been said to me. Nick was given a final warning and a write-up. The next couple of times I saw him he would go on rants about how people there were only reporting him because they didn't like him. 
I assume he didn't know that I had been questioned too, and neither Josh or I had any intention to tell him. He got so angry at one point that he practically was in tears, saying how lucky those fools were that he was on his meds and what he would do to them if he wasn't. Luckily, he was at about that point that his shift ended. And pretty much as soon as he clocked out, Josh told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night. So we didn't really have time to chat with him. He nodded and walked out the door without another word. Josh wasn't lying either. The truck had come extremely late that day. So there were still quite a bit of things that still needed to be put on the shelf. One thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to do, unless they absolutely had to was stocking the drinks cooler. It was true. That was easier to do at night when there were a lot less customers. So it was annoying since we couldn't chat, but we just went with it. I can't remember the time that Josh went into the drink cooler, but it must have been pretty late since we had been there for a while. At that point, I was still focused on stocking the shelves and making sure everything looked full if we didn't have it. When the bell chimes signaling someone had come in throughout a good evening, and I'd be right there since anyone that came in that late usually only wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for gas and cash. I put down my box and went to the register slowing dramatically once I could see them. You guessed it, there was Nick, not looking at me, but leading next to my register. I'd be lying if I said I had a reason to be afraid. It did turn out he was drunk, but I couldn't detect it right away from the smell of booze that always seemed to linger in the air around there and Josh was right on the other side of the wall. Even so I considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go or if I should run into the cooler and get Josh. Nick wasn't a young fit guy or anything. Years of drugs and drinking had aged him prematurely and ruined his body. But he was still intimidating to a 20-year-old girl. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me when probably tired of waiting turned toward me, and that's when I noticed immediately that there was something off about him. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whisper when I asked him what he wanted. He just stared at me. Nothing of his face to tell me what he was thinking. I was about to speak again when he spoke, barely intelligible, because of his slurring. He leave you there alone. It took me a second to shake my head and tell him in a hopefully stead voice that Josh was in the cooler and asked if he wanted me to go get him again, staring at me in silence. At this point, I didn't care what he said. I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was creeping me out. I asked with more force in my voice. What do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he grinned at me in a disgusting, almost singing voice. He said you lie saying you are alone. He laughed and took a step toward me, but stumbled allowing me to take several steps back. At this point, I should have run to Josh. I should have called for him anything, but I couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right. Nick was really weird, but I had never felt an actual danger around him before. He had never come off as more than a little unstable. It continued to come forward and slow stumbling steps telling me to come here. I just want to talk. I kept out of his reach, telling him to back off and that I would hurt him if I had to. He thought that was particularly amusing and laughed loudly enough that Josh told me later was what caused him to look through the spaces the racks and see what was going on. Josh was out of the door in a second and seemed to come out of nowhere shipping himself in between Nick and I. They didn't even say anything. Just stare at each other down before Josh said and that stern tone. I think you should leave now man. Nick stared blankly for a moment, then scoffed, telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't been there, and he had somehow caught me, I would have stood no chance against him. Josh left me standing with my back against the wall, corralling Nick to the door. Completely unexpected on both of our parts. Nick turned and took a swing at Josh. Luckily, either because he was drunk or just really uncoordinated. He missed Josh's face, and Josh grabbed the back of his coat and brought him down as he smashed his knee and in Nick's stomach or chest area. 
I'm not sure which, and used the opportunity of his sputtering to drag him to the door and throw him out locking it. Josh had just turned in, told me to call the cops as we heard the sickening crack behind him. We both jumped and looked at the door to find this big circle of glass. It's hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie of one or an actual car wreck when something's hit a windshield, but not hard enough to break through it. It turns white all around the point of impact. That's what the door looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do. This time I ran to the register and grabbed my phone go into the corner furthest away from the front door and huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh told me later that when he turned to see the glass, that was the first time that he noticed that Nick had a hunting knife in his other hand, the fact that he had tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a mystery and a miracle. I was sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so hard. But between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling each other in the background with loud smashes of nicotine in the door, she got the urgency of the situation. She asked me where I was. And luckily she knew the address because just as I got up to look at the receipt to see what the address was, the glass smashed and dropped back to the floor and she told me that officers were already on the way and to do whatever I could to get away or hide. Even if I had to leave Josh. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through, and he had made it by grabbing the ashtray from outside and throwing it at part of the window. He had been repeatedly punching, causing it to break through. He didn't make it to break through. From that hole, he could reach the lock on the door. According to Josh, he walked to the door and put his mouth against the hole that he had just formed that said something and sobbing now just thinking about it. In that horrible sing-song voice that he had used the first time I talked to him that night. He said in such a happy tone. That never gonna find you too. Needless to say as tough as he was acting, Josh was completely losing it as much as I was. He was older than Nick in his mid-thirties. But he was a beanpole and wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh slammed his body into it, knocking Nick backward from the impact. Josh yelled for me to run into even though my legs felt like they could give out at any moment. I ran right behind him to the receiving doors in the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling for us as the door jingle went off. Josh slammed into the back door cursing in pain as he realized that it wouldn't open. We found out later that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door locking the wheels of it again, before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he actually planned how he was going to end our lives. Nick rounded the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk though faster now. It's at least gave me time to slam the back door room shut and lock it. I was sitting in front of it. Josh bringing over anything he could define to bear, K the door shut, when Nick reached it. He must have heard me crying because it kept calling out my name telling me that I wasn't who he wanted. He would make sure that I died before I even felt the pain if I opened the door. He then started stabbing the door, screaming at me to open it. I screamed and moved when he stabbed it the first time. But Josh and I both moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. We were both crying by now. And I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I dropped my phone when I ran to hold the door shut and neither of us could move to go get it. So we had no idea how long until the police got there. And the door was made out of wood. So wouldn't last long against his body slammed and offered no protection if his knife went into one of our hands. All we could think about was that I was going to die here, that my dog would never know why I didn't come home that I would never get my degree and have enough money to actually start enjoying my life. That all the plans for the future my girlfriend I had made what never happened. And the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever. It suddenly went silent. There was no police car alarms, no yelling nothing. It was as if though Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other not even daring to breathe listening for any sign of life on the other side of the door. We both slammed to the ground when a gunshot went off once, then twice. 
and then a third time. There was mere silence then a voice rang out asking if anyone was here. We weren't sure if we should say anything. Then the voice continued with his name and that he was an off-duty EMT who had been listening to the scanner. Josh got up and pushed the thing as died in front of the door, opening it just enough to put his head out of it. And then it seemed like all the breath just left him. He opened the door and went out into the store. I ran and grabbed my phone seeing that the call had disconnected or the dispatcher had hung up. When I went on to the store where Josh and a rescuer was, he was in the middle of explaining how the police over the scan and were sending a bunch of cars. But they all were pretty far away and had a horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling them what they'd find when they got there. He didn't want either of us to go outside until the police got there. Though Nick had been shot in the shoulder. He had still had the knife when he took off. The EMT said he would have run after him, but with the state that the store was in, he was scared that someone in here could be dying hurt. The next 20 minutes was a blur. Josh and I was sitting on the floor hugging each other when the police got there. The EMT had called dispatch and told them at the new situation and most of the cars that were coming to our location were diverted to looking for Nick. It was soon after that that Josh got to use his phone to call his wife and she came right over, only bringing their daughter because he begged her to he seemed to completely break down when he held his daughter and hugged his wife. I had an extremely similar reaction when I finally got to go home and came to see my dog's body wiggling excitedly, proudly displaying his flamingo toy for me to have as a welcome home gift. Nick was found two weeks later in an old RV in the woods that he'd been using to do his drinking and do drugs so his wife couldn't catch him. Apparently, the reason he had come after us was because he had thought that the reason that Josh wanted them to leave so quickly was so he could call the owner again and this time, the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us his wife had kicked him out four days before this happened and was in the process of getting a restraining order against him over threatening texts and phone calls she had been getting. He stated that his job was all that he had left. And Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him. He said that I wasn't the target. And he didn't want to have to end my life. But he knew that he had a much better chance of killing Josh with me there than Dixie since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. Neither Josh or I called the owner, even a manager over his comments that night, though, maybe we should have. It was disturbing what he was saying in hindsight. But we were so used to him being a creep and saying really horrible things at that point, that it didn't even register to us that he could be serious about trying to hurt someone. I had known him for three months, and Josh had known him for six. And he had never done anything violent toward anyone. Everyone just thought he was all talk. We also put faith in the fact that every employee had a background checked on them before they were hired. So it's not like Nick had ever been violent before. He took a plea deal, so the two counts of attempted murder would be dropped. And he would instead go to a mental hospital for